First of all, let's give a hand to Dan, the man who's back from Florida. Great to be back. With some nicer weather would have followed me, but it's great to see everybody. Now, while Dan was in Florida, he was offered a job making twice as much money, plus a house with a pool by the beach and a brand new motorcycle. And he said, no, I'm sorry, I can't accept it, because then I couldn't play drums at Biker Church Amen. anymore. That's so right, he came folks. back. That's right, I'm here. This is better than all that. <laughs> Now, I have uh, made no secret of the fact that I am not a fan of country music, not a fan. However, I am a fan of talent. And uh, we had a death last, last week in the country music world, a legend, Merle Haggard. One of his most famous songs was Oki from Muskogee. So we changed the words. And please remain seated. Relax, enjoy yourself. So with apologies to the late Merle Haggard, we took your song and changed it. We don't mock Jesus at BC. And we don't use his name disrespectfully. We don't ride too fast. Down on Main Street And we like living right And being free We don't make a habit Out of judging Like so many other people do Don't exclude anybody Like the hypocrites in some churches do And I'm proud to be a biker who loves Jesus Even though some things it can't be done They all have their thoughts and their opinions And when they see us pray, they're all fine Leather boots are the style for our footwear Flip flops and sandals won't be seen I got to tell you, I had a, I don't usually do this, but I had a particular person in mind when uh, I uh, wrote the course, even though so, a biker loves Jesus, even though some think it can't be done. Um, I actually have a friend whose parents cannot believe he can be a Christian and ride a motorcycle. But, so, <laughs> that, was for, that was for my buddy, well, I won't say his name. He's not here, but he might watch us. I don't want to embarrass him. You can, be, you can be a Christian and ride a motorcycle, Amen. right? Amen. That's right. Yeah, all right. Okay, thank you. All right. Glenn Campbell, who uh, I don't think he knows he's Glenn Campbell anymore, uh, wrote this song, and this is the real words to this song. Put your hand in the hand of the man sitting in the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man to come on the sea. Take a look at yourself and 
Every time I look into the holy book, I want to tremble. When I read about the part where the carpenter cleaned near the temple. For the buyers and the sellers were no different tellers than what I profess to be. And it causes me shame to know I'm not the man that I should be. So put your hand in the hand of the man that near the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man and come on the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man, Galilee. Mama taught me how to pray before I reach the age of seven. And when I'm down on my knees, that's when I'm close, close to heaven. Daddy lived his life with two kids and a wife. You do what you must do. And he showed me enough of what it takes to do. By putting your hand in the hand of the man to fill the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man upon the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Hey. All right, so our five, since this country, that's why the straw hats, by the way. And we had to get Gleason a special hat because his head's so big. <laughs> his word's not mine. All right, it's a kind of a country bluesy song. It's called Death Ain't No Big Deal. The doctor takes one look and says, you're dead. The truth is, it's gonna finally be repeated. Oh, I'm gonna find out death ain't no big deal. He reached down and gently closed my eyes. I'll sail right past the moon unto the stars And I'll be amazed when I get to heaven's gate Cause I do my way home by heart The light will be much brighter
tell your children that thing our home big deal. Lord, we know for those of us who know you as our Lord and Savior. It's not a big deal. It's just a transition. It's just moving from one place to another. It's leaving all the horribleness of this world behind and walking into perfection for eternity. I don't know why I ever thought that life here was the best that I would ever experience. I now realize that this is, this is the, the worst compared to heaven. However, if I'm not going to heaven, this is the best I'll ever have because after this, it gets nothing but worse. So I thank you that you don't discriminate. I don't have to be a certain color or have a certain IQ or have a certain amount of money or have the Bible memorized. I need to simply acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and be unashamed to tell others, repent of my sins, change my ways, which I have done, and you will change my heart and change my life and change my future. And truly, death ain't no big deal. Now, I know there's some folks here tonight that are carrying heavy burdens, and they're kind of personal to them and confidential. But you know everything. You know the people involved. You know what's needed. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus for miracles where needed. By faith, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, God is good. All and all the time. Let Jesus be seen in 2016. Amen. Hallelujah. 263rd week ago, once again, our man Gleason keeps it going, although I think next week he won't need any help, will he? I hope. We're going to travel all the way to the basement tonight where Olson's Bakery has brought their goodies once again, and they will be available to you. Well, uh, Marv, before we change this, Lisa, what kind of cupcake is that? Raspberry cheesecake. I hope, I'm glad you know, because that's off your website or your Facebook page or something. <laughs> I had to stretch it out, though, so it doesn't look like it does in real life in order to fill the screen. All right, we'll be going downstairs and we're done here. Here's the events we have coming up. We've been advertising these for weeks. I'll give you a minute if you want to uh, reboot uh, your brain or take a picture of the screen or whatever. Uh, this Saturday, no, next Saturday... So we got uh, one more Monday to tell you about the pulled pork meal. Uh, the biker breakfast is coming up. And again, for those of you who have volunteered to help with the biker breakfast, be there by 8.30, please. We'll tell you more about the biker blessing and the ride to Forestville when we get closer. That's it. All right. It is a deacon, chaplain, chef, Wayne Knight. He wears many hats, but none more important than preaching the word. And here he is. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I mean, there's, I don't know why, but I feel the urge to say this, and I even, even have not even told my wife yet. Um, so I guess I got to tell her now, because all you guys will know. And it was a weird, really weird thing, and I didn't even want to say it, because it was even really weird for me. Um, I just had this, I don't know, maybe it was like a vision or a daydream. It was middle of the day. It wasn't a, a dream like at night. And it really felt amazing. It was my wife and I, which actually, see, it's a vision. Um, my wife and I were just actually running through this beautiful meadow. And it was the most beautiful thing. It's giving me goosebumps. It was the most beautiful thing that I had ever seen or thought. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm telling her, this is just so beautiful. And the fact that we're both actually running would tell you it's not here. Um, and it was, just, it was just the most amazing, amazing feeling. Um, now I'm probably dead because I told you guys first. So, but it was, uh, I still don't know what to make of it. It was just really awesome. So either we're not going to be here too much longer, that song fits, or I, God gave me what, something what I needed. And another thing I just thought of um, was this one pastor said that uh, he's been going to church all his life. 59 years and nine months. Yeah. I like that. Did you get that? 59 years and nine months. 
All right. So, okay. I'm glad I got that in there because this was kind of short tonight. So, um, Okay, tonight, finally, it's Matthew's night to shine. No more calling me sinners, you sinners, or anything like that. That uh, was gone, but good. Um, everybody pretty well knows who uh, the Apostle Matthew is, right? He's pretty much one of the, the famous ones. If not, and this is a little vague, I will be happy to fill you in after any time, um, especially if you take me to lunch and you really get the whole special, the nine yards. Um, we have a little question and answer time first. And I actually want to go by going back to the actual, just you know, raise your hand once you get the answer. Uh, who was Matthew and what did he do? Tax collector. All right, Fred. For as it says in God's word, Matthew 9.9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Okay, question number two. We're going to throw in a true and false, true or false. Was Matthew present at the Last Supper? No. Was he at the Last Supper? Come on. It's either yes or no. Don't be ashamed. Huh? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Yes is correct. Of course he was, because he was one of the original disciples. All right? Okay. So, yes. Okay. There we go. Awesome. Pretty smart. You had me worried there for a second, but we're pretty good now. Then we find in Matthew 26, 20. Now, notice this is out of the book of Matthew. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. So he was obviously one of the twelve. He wrote the book, Matthew. So, Okay, now we got one more question. This one's going to be a little bit harder. What message did Jesus want to get across to everyone with the example of Matthew? Using Matthew's example in the Bible. Because I think everything has an example and a relativeness in the Bible. Um, no, what he wanted us to most relay. Change life. There you go, pretty much. Um, that was it, change life. You know, and sinners and outcasts because how he had the dinner. And, um, you know, with the, uh, we'll get into it with the prostitutes and uh, all the people that normally most people won't even hang around with. So, good, we passed it. That was very good. Um, so pretty much, I guess, I told you it was short. The sermon is over. I just brought a lot of papers to make me look smart. So we can all go down to Olson's. I'm going to take the back way. Okay. But you kind of knew that that wouldn't be true. I'd have to talk about something. So um, I could talk about Matthew and most of the stuff people know, you know, but I just want to make a couple more statements and kind of get into something a little bit, a little bit different about Matthew and his writings and, and the Bible. Um, Jesus called upon Matthew the tax collector, right? That's what he was. Now, is it just me, or does a little hair stand up on the back of your neck, me actually on my head, whenever you mention the name tax collector? Especially it's getting close, right? Tax collector. Just as you hear it more and more, tax collector. And then how it rolls off your tongue, tax collector. Right? <laughs> right? And it's coming close. It's usually about the 15th, right? And then they always give you like a couple extra days, that type of thing. So, okay, we're not going to... So we know that. And Jesus called upon Matthew to follow him, and he got right up, left his booth, and followed him. Okay? I don't know who collected the rest of the tax is, who became the new tax collector. Um, well, they weren't pretty well-liked, probably actually a thousand times worse off than the IRS because they did an awful lot of skim and charged more as, as long as the, the Romans got their proper duty or, I guess, taxes, whatever you want to say. So they weren't the best of people. And then we know that Matthew invited Jesus to his place, and there was prostitutes there and shady people and, you know, all kinds of bikers and stuff. Um, and, you know, they weren't really very, very liked. So everybody was whispering, what's Jesus doing with all those? And the Pharisees jumped in, right? They found their opportunity. And I'm not even going to mention about the political climate. You can fill all that stuff in however you want. Um, 
So he, you know, it's, what's he doing over there? He says he's the Messiah, the King of the Jews. He's over there with those people, right? And then I was kind of thinking too, kind of in my uh, few of my, my days and, and stuff, and I think Pastor Don said one time they went to uh, get ice cream and that guy wouldn't serve them. So it's kind of like a time or two a bunch of bikers would pull in some place to eat. You know, people would kind of hold their children, put them behind their back, and, you know, and, uh, you know, like you're going to eat them or something. You know what I always wanted to say? I always wanted to say, no, 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 ma'am. Your, your children are much too big. They put too much of a fight. I usually go for the little children. So, but I never did. And, uh, and then it doesn't stop there. And then when you go in to the place, right, they always escort you to, like, the back room or the little lonely table in the corner, right? And uh, I always wanted to say to that is, uh, thank you, ma'am. These seats are great and excellent defensive position. Thank you very much. You know, and let them see how they, you know, how it goes from there. But I don't know. That's just me, I guess. Um, so we all kind of know about Matthew and these accounts of his life and most bikers. You know, I want to move in a little different direction. I want to look at Matthew and the Bible from a historical standpoint. Um, took a course in hermeneutics. It's called Big Long Word for Properly Deciphering the Bible and um, all kinds of stuff. The face value, literary value, and the historical value is, is what you look at um, when you're reading the Bible and picking things out and trying to understand some, some things. Um, so the Gospel according to Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. So it's the first book that you, you get to after the Old Testament. It's the first one if you want to start right after the New Testament. Uh, the narrative tells how Messiah Jesus, rejected by Israel, finally sends the disciples to preach his gospel to the whole world, right? So I think it would be safe to say that the book of Matthew is a history lesson also. It tells the life of Jesus from verse 1 in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1 says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And they said that even, I was reading the little footnotes and I got a John Wesley study Bible, and they said it was even strange that they brought that genealogy into it um, in, in that way. Um, so it was really, for some reason, somewhere... Um, and then how you go, that's the first verse, and then you go to the last verse, last two, how it sums all up in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And most of you probably know that. That's within the Great Commission, the last two lines in the Bible. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Man, what better promise could you get than that? Right? These, these are promises. They're promises of God. Then uh, in a historical point, what do you have in between one and the end, right? Well, there is murder, deception, great signs of love, there's the Beatitudes. We would never have time to just scratch the surface of the great historical book of the Bible, especially just in Matthew. If we wanted to go back to all those things, the, the Beatitudes and everything that, that is in there as the first book. And mostly I want to narrow it down now to the end, the last two verses. In, these, in this section, Jesus transfers the authority to his disciples. You know, not going to be here anymore physically. You're going to have the helper, the Holy Spirit. But it's time that you take it up now. And he sends them out on the Great Commission. And in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, in God's word, and together we will win people to Jesus Christ, establish them in the faith. Right, we're going to go a little bit. That's going to stay up there. We're going to go a little bit more into it. So I guess to encourage... I don't think you really need more encouragement than that, even though there's going to be a little more. So as we go, you know, we go out highways and on the two-laners, 
to the cities as well as the towns. You know, we preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Even if they stick us in the back room or the back corner, then we could minister to the waitresses and the waiter or the folks heading to the bathroom. And you know what? You can even use words if you want to. I don't know, that isn't mine. I don't know if you ever heard that. Preach Christianity as much as you can and even use words if you have to. I really don't mind being put in the back room either, getting back on that subject. I'm, you can tell I'm not sore on that subject, right? But actually being, because I think it's actually to the advantage. Because it's like people want to know, well, why are they going way back there? You know, and I would take it one start, you know, that's where all the mafioso guys would sit, they would sit way in the back. You know, so, you know, but I don't want to use it for that point. And then what would he say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I love that. Everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Becoming a disciple is what Jesus wants. He wants that. That's what he trained him for. That's what he trained him up for. That's what his word is supposed to train us up for. And one of the things of scoping churches and scouting things, it was like I would go so far at a place, put six months or a year of my time in, and then find out they secretly believe that you got to worship the pews every Friday night at 3 o'clock in the morning or something. You know, something weird. And it's like, oh, no. Now i got to start over again. So I started doing a little more research, and I came up to the guide, you know, John Wesley, Anglican, Methodist, Free Methodist, B.T. Roberts here. Um, and he really was shunned by a lot of the other theologians, speaking of hermeneutics and that, okay, because he didn't flaunt it around. He gave a lot of his money away. Um, and I kind of coined him the working man's theologian because he could always pretty much say things and explain things in a layman's terms. So that's why, you know what? I'm going there. And that's where I went. And then the, as more as we got into the, the free Methodist faith and becoming a deacon, our mission is just that. You know, churches have a mission statement, a vision statement. You know, our mission is to, to love God and people and to make disciples. Right? Make disciples. And that's what we hear a lot when we do go to some of the district meetings. And, um, you know, it's all about making disciples. We're them. You're, you're looking at them right here. This is, what, this is what God has. Right here, it has us. And don't think you can't do it. Because you can. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for being able to deliver your word in a fashion that I hope that you would want me to deliver, that there's no Wayne in there involved. I'm sorry, except for little biker stories. But I just hold myself and all these folks up to you, Lord, that we could go out and we could be able to, if not speak Christianity, show Christianity, and the times that we have to speak, let it be that impaling of the Holy Spirit into a person, that they would just be impaled with it. Not laid upon them, just impaled, that they'd want to learn more. Prepare to places that we go and have ready and willing, able people that just want to hear the gospel, Lord, just want to hear about you, something true and just in a crazy world. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.